when we're talking about linear transformations from one finite dimensional space, we'll say V, to another finite dimensional space, W, two spaces arise. The image and the kernel of the transformation, both of which are subspaces, to visualize, I drew this little diagram. If V is our domain, where we're starting, the kernel is right in here. It's all the vectors that map to the zero vector in our codomain. On the other hand, the image of the transformation, which we can also represent as T bracket, and then whatever letter represents our domain, so the transformed version of our original vector space, what will that look like in our new space? This is the image of our transformation, or the space that it reaches when we do the transformation. How much space does it cover in W, our codomain? The image of a transformation, since transformations can be represented as a matrix, would be equal to the image of the matrix, which is equal to the column space of the matrix A, which we've already talked about. This is included, since we're looking at T of V, the transformed version of our vector V, this is a subspace of W. The kernel of our transformation, on the other hand, is all the vectors in V such that when we transform them, they land on the zero vector in W. Since we're talking about vectors in our set V, this is a subspace of V, a subspace of our domain, whereas the image is a subspace in our codomain, or the range of the transformation. The kernel of a transformation represented by a matrix is equivalent with saying the null space of our matrix A. Let's talk about how to find a basis for the image and the kernel of a transformation. If we have our matrix A down below, it's all about where are your leading ones. First of all, for our image of our transformation, we see we have a leading one in the first and second column. We've reduced our matrix using row operations to reduced row echelon form. If we're just looking for our image or the column space, we don't need to go all the way to reduced row echelon form. Row echelon form suffices, but to find the kernel, we need to go all the way. Reduce as simple as possible. So the basis of the image would be the first two columns of our original matrix. On the other hand, the basis of the kernel is all solutions to the homogeneous system. That means we have our matrix A with a zero column, which we don't have to write because it's not affected by row operations. We convert to reduced row echelon form. If we have any non-leading columns, this is the number of solutions we have to our homogeneous system. And these solutions form the basis of the kernel of the transformation or the null space of the matrix. In this case, let's call this A, B, and C. Column C is non-leading, so let's say C is a parameter. Let's express A and B in terms of C. A would be, if we move the C to the opposite side, negative 4 over 3C, and B would be positive 1 third C. So a solution to our homogeneous system would be negative 4 thirds C, 1 third C, and then C, because C is our parameter. This means the kernel of our transformation. We could now write as the span, because span is just a linear combination, we could equivalently write this as the span to eliminate fractions of negative four, one, three. And this is our basis of the kernel. What happens if we add the rank of the transformation and the nullity of the transformation? Well, the rank is the dimension of the image of the transformation. And another word for nullity is the dimension of the kernel of the transformation. And what does this equal? Since the rank is the number of leading columns and the nullity is the number of non-leading columns in a matrix that represents our transformation, we can conclude that this is n, the number of columns. Or another way to state this would be the dimension if our transformation is from v to w of v. What happens if the basis of our domain contains the kernel of the transformation, meaning the vectors that go straight to the zero vector in the codomain? This is a special case where if we transform the remaining vectors, we can find the basis of the image of the transformation. In this case, it's clear that R 
represents the rank of the transformation or the number of leading ones. This corresponds to the number of elements in the basis of our image. Let's try an example. Find a basis of M22, all four by four matrices, that includes the kernel of the transformation, and then find a basis for the image of the transformation. When it's transformed, we have to multiply on the left by our matrix A. So let's do this multiplication. Let's say X is A, B, C, D. We get A plus C, B plus D, zero, zero. Now what's the kernel of the transformation? Let's first write out the definition. So the kernel of the transformation we know is in our original space. It's all matrices, X, such that when we apply the transformation, A times X, we get zero. Well, the zero matrix in M22, which is zero, 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 zero. When is our matrix equal to the zero matrix? Well, this will be true when A plus C equals zero and when B plus D equals zero. A equals negative C and B equals negative D. Now let's rewrite this matrix. Instead of writing X as A, B, C, D, if X is a part of the kernel, it's going to look like this for some C and D that are real numbers. Of course, because C and D are totally separate, we can separate them into the sum of two matrices. And the linear combination of two matrices is just a span. So we could say that the kernel of the transformation is the span of these two matrices. And are these matrices independent? Well, yes, because there's only two, we can just look at them and say they're not multiples of one another. So yes, they're independent. Therefore, they form a basis of the kernel of T. Next, to find a basis of M22, our domain, that includes the matrices of the kernel, we need to add two more matrices. We could go about solving this in a systematic method, but instead, let's just try adding in two matrices from the standard basis of M22 that have one one and the rest of the elements zero. To check if these matrices do form a basis of M22, we have to check that they're independent. Next, let's simplify the left side. What are the equations we end up with? A minus C equals zero, B minus D equals zero, C equals zero and D equals zero. So clearly this means that A is zero and B is zero as well. Since we have only the trivial solution, this set of matrices does form a basis of M22. Since there are four, we know it spans the entire space. So this is true. Next, in order to generate a basis of the image of the transformation, we have two options. Let's first try it using the theorem. We have the kernel of the transformation included in a basis of the domain. So that means the other two matrices, if we transform them, will form a basis of the image of the transformation. Once again, our transformation is the matrix A, 1, 1, 0, 0, times whatever matrix we're transforming. Okay, this is a special case where when we applied the transformation, the matrices actually stayed the same. In any case, this isn't usually what happens. We can conclude that the basis of the image of the transformation is comprised of these two matrices. We could also have figured this out by looking again at what the transformation actually does. We know that the image of the transformation is in the codomain. So it's going to be a x, where x is any two by two matrix. We can think of this matrix AX as having some number in the top left component and another number in the top right component. So then the matrices are going to be in the form of EF00, where E and F are just real numbers. We can rewrite this as a span of the matrices 1000 and 0100. And since our domain is four dimensional, the nullity of our transformation is two. We know this means the rank of our transformation is four minus two. So therefore these two vectors span the entire image space and we can see they're independent as they're not multiples of one another. Thus, as we concluded before, these two matrices form a basis 
of the image of the transformation.